After all that has been said and done and discovered and realized, if one is still holding on to the animated so-called life of the construct of flesh and bones, of mind and soul, then one probably will never realize the depth of the falsehood of this realm, nor, consequently, transcend it. More than any other social and political end goal that any given psyop or emotion-inducing propaganda can have, at its core is a constant and implicit yet hidden and unspoken question. Do you fear me? Whatever you answer to that, within yourself and even without words, notice how it always responds yelling, Fear me! Just like Ray Liotta's character in Revolver. Why is fear so foundational to this world, this entire realm? I have come to contemplate and realize that, and this is only, as always, my view, it is because fear is what solidifies. It is the kind of frequency of vibration, or whatever else it may be, or that one might prefer to call it, that somehow turns light into matter, that makes a hologram become palpable, tangible, and, consequently, given the nature of fear itself, always painful, one way or another. That pain is the dukkha for the Buddhists, whose weaver, that I identified as fear, is Mara. Mara relies on Maya, that is, the belief on the self-deceit about the world, to maintain the fear. Fear of loss, fear of death, fear of fear. In the same manner that a purity remains in the outline beyond the details of Christianity, as discussed in a previous contemplation, it is so too with Buddhism, which is also a salvationist myth, as the Buddha also came to save the fallen in Dukkha with the Dhamma, the equivalent to Christ's verb. Also common to both is the later adulteration by those who felt threatened by its purity and the resulting lack of fear it would cause. So details were added, adulterated and edited, but it is in the outline always the truth can be picked up by our compatible essence. I will affirm that indeed the devil is always in the details. Now, some might tell me that fear is a useful emotion given the threats of the world. I agree. It is useful to the extent of a signal that a pet animal manager, the ego, can read and interpret and therefore wisely make choices taking it into consideration. Middle ground, however. For it is easy for the blind animal manager within us to lose sight of the essential and be overwhelmed by the ebb and flow of the tides of emotion. Worse even, it may become addicted to them, losing sight altogether. Yet note that I am not framing this in a manner similar to the New Age uh, charlatans, so well depicted by Patrick Schwayze's character in Donnie Darko. It is not about absence of fear for the emotional addicted ego, it is about absence of fear for the essence-connected ego. An emotional addict without any fear blocking them will have validation to only seek emotion that seems pleasing, refusing any emotional messages that may break their good vibe, so to speak, and to indulge in seemingly pleasant emotion without ever getting the signal that a moderation might be a good idea. However, an essence-connected ego will use fear as a marker to contemplate upon, to understand what it points towards and realize its true message beyond the immediate contextual framework. The difference is that the first is what could be called a materialist in the making, worshipper of matter, the world of emotions, where their juices flow, fearing only the cessation of the drug that keeps them interested, and one with the contrary effect. 
As any drug, it tends to become insufficient after a while. As the requirements of excitement become deeper, so do the requirements of the emotional drug as well. The second type of ego status, on the other hand, will use fear to avoid addiction. As they know, through realization or inner revelation, that metaphorically the signal is better picked up at the middle of the mountain peak, not on any of its sides, be them overindulgence or overdiscipline. And that sort of wisdom that comes to the fore, that knowing of what is good and what is evil beyond the illusory veil placed upon our minds when looking at this realm, is both Dhamma and Logos. It is exactly that morality mentioned and addressed in the previous contemplation named Christianity. The purity that resides in the outline never details of these myths. I repeat, given its importance, only a pure myth outline will be able to convey truth by realization and inner revelation. Details in the myth only move one further from the outline and, therefore, further into materiality. So, now that one reaches this pure, immutable, timeless morality from a connection to truth, what then in regards to the world? If nothing else, the world is a test of a character that wields that morality, a tool that fits only their hands, metaphorically speaking. So it will present before them questions, usually all just rephrasings of that same one question asked by any illusion. Do you fear me? The true moral answer the true moral choice then is given once the question is consciously realized and transforms fear, dismantling its foundational illusion, which is addiction. If fear is declined in that moral choice, then a part of the illusory world is cast out, a part of it dissolves, and one's answer breaches the realm's carapace and signals our intent with both animal ego and essence together, that this is not our home. Many fears can be thrown at us in this material realm. Fear of death, fear of sickness, fear of starvation, fear of absence of pleasure, even fear of running out of toilet paper, huh? <laughs> and it is our moral choice to provide a centered, wise answer to each of the same questions poised by them. They're actually nothing more than beggary behind a mask of strength. And maybe there will come a time in which we are all asked this same question again, in an ultimate manner. Do you fear me? Fear me. Fear me, please, or else I die. Spoke the devil.